My name is Kathy Schultz, and I am the Water Education Specialist with the California Department of Water Resources. And I would like to welcome you to a HERP for every season. The mission of the California Department of Water Resources is to sustainably manage the water resources of California in cooperation with other agencies to benefit the state's people and protect, restore, and enhance the natural and human environments. Our first five Water Wednesdays are taking us into one of those natural environments, the Sacramento, Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta. The Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta covers 500,000 acres uh, and it's found between San Francisco Bay to the west and Sacramento, Stockton, and Lodi to the east. And this maze of land and water forms where the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers meet. The Delta is one of California's most important natural resources. It provides water to over 27 million Californians and hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland, as well as homes to hundreds, if not thousands of species of wildlife. In our past Water Wednesday episodes, we've learned about some of the fish, the bugs, and the birds that make their home in the Delta. And today we'll be learning about the critters that scientists refer to as herps. And Veronica Wunderlich is here to talk about those today. Uh, Veronica is an environmental scientist with DWR, and she will be telling you all about these herps in just a moment. Um, but before I turn it over to her, I just want to uh, review a couple of logistics. If you are joining us through Zoom, we have turned off your cameras and um, asked you to mute your microphones, but we really do want to hear from you. So you can pose questions in your chat box um, throughout the program and we will do our best to answer them. If you haven't used the chat feature on Zoom before, you just need to go down to the bottom of your screen. You'll see there's a little uh, speech bubble with the word chat under it and you can just type whatever questions you have in there. You can let us know what your favorite herp is um, if you don't know what that is, you'll know in just a moment. And uh, you don't need to wait until the end to ask questions. So go ahead and um, let us know what, what you think throughout the program. And now I'd like to turn things over to Veronica. Thank you. Um, okay, let's see if I can get this done properly. <laughs> Okay. Okay. This thing. Did I do it wrong? Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Good with herps, not so much with computers. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Veronica Wunderlich, like Kathy said, and I'm a senior environmental scientist with the California Department of Water Resources. Today, I would like to share with you a small window into the world of herpetology. So without further ado, let's talk about a herp for every season. The first question that you might have is what exactly is a herp? A herp is a shortening of the word herptile, which comes from the Latin herpeton, which means creeping thing. And the creeping things that we're talking about today are reptiles and amphibians. The study of reptiles and amphibians is called herpetology. Here in California, we have a lot of different herps, including snakes, lizards, turtles, frogs, toads, salamanders, and newts, some of which you can see pictured here. So where do our reptile and amphibian friends live in the Delta? Well, that answer is just about everywhere. Many herps use both water and land for at least part of their lives. We call the place where they live habitat. The type of habitat, aquatic, which means water, and upland, which means dry land, that they use depends on the stage of life that they're in as well as time of year. Some species like the Western fence lizard that you can see here in the upper left spend their whole lives on land, but that's not true of everyone. The giant garter snake on the bottom left is a great swimmer spending the whole summer in and around the water. Western pond turtles like this guy in the middle spend their adult lives enjoying the water, but they start their lives in nests built on land. And the California tiger salamander starts their life in the water and breathes through gills and then changes what we call going through metamorphosis to an adult that lives on land and breathes with lungs. You can see the young aquatic and adult California tiger salamander on the lower right. But not all salamanders need to spend their part of their lives in water. That tiny little salamander in the upper right hand corner is the California slender salamander. Slender salamanders spend their entire life on land, but in moist areas. So let's look at what habitat is available to our herp friends in the Delta. 
The delta has many different habitats which provide places for reptiles and amphibians to live. Aquatic habitat includes rivers and sloughs and even irrigation ditches and freshwater, tidal marshes, ponds and seasonal pools, which are the pools that only hold water for part of the year. But the delta is not just water. The delta also includes dry land or upland habitats, including the kind that borders water where trees and shrubs grow, which we call riparian, and the grassland that often has ponds nestled within them, a variety of agricultural fields, and there are even sand dunes. You can see some of the examples of these habitat types here. The photo in the center is the Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Refuge, which has an amazing, unique, and beautiful dune habitat with some very special plants and animals that live only there. This is a wide variety of habitat types in the Delta, and that's why we have such a lovely variety of wildlife. So let's talk a bit more about some of the neat reptiles and amphibians we can find in the Delta. Delta lizards include the Southern and Northern alligator lizard, which you can see to the left. We also have Western fence lizards. These lizards are often referred to as blue bellies because the males have bright blue patches on the edges of their bellies and throats. You probably have seen these little lizards sitting on rocks and fence posts doing push-ups. We also have Western skinks and Gilbert skinks. You can see in the picture of the skink at the bottom right that it has a very blue tail, but this one seems awfully short. That's because the skink, like many lizards, has the ability to drop its tail if it's in danger of being it eaten. Once the tail is dropped, the lizard can grow a new tail. The blue tail is characteristic of a young skink. One of the most unusual lizards that we have in the Delta is the Northern California legless lizard. You can see that in the upper right-hand corner. You may be wondering, why is this a lizard and not a snake? It has no legs, but what it does have, which distinguishes it from a snake, is eyelids. That's right, lizards have eyelids, so they can blink, but snakes, no such luck. All these lizards pictured here are active during the day, which is called diurnal. So what are our common delta snakes? Well, we have common sharp-tailed snakes, and they live in several habitats. If you ever find one in your garden, you should welcome these little guys because they'll gobble up all of your slugs. There are also several species of garter snake, not gardener snake, including common garter snake, the terrestrial garter snake, and the giant garter snake, which we'll talk about more later. We also have California king snakes, which live in a wide variety of habitats and have been known to eat rattlesnakes, which is pretty cool. We have Pacific gopher snakes, which people sometimes mistake for rattlesnakes. They take advantage of that by trying their best to act the part and they'll shake their tails and they'll smoosh their little heads looking like or imitating another animal is called mimicry. And it's used to help this non-venomous snake protect itself from danger. Unfortunately, this can lead to people hurting them or killing them because they're afraid that this harmless snake might hurt the person. Of course, this is not a full list of snakes as there are even more snake species in and beyond the Delta, such as ring neck snakes, whip snakes, and even our only venomous snake, the rattlesnake but we need more to, we need to move on. So we have time to talk more about amphibians. The Delta has some fantastic amphibians, including the land-based California tiger, or California slender salamander. These small salamanders are frequent visitors to damp spawns under items such as logs, rocks, leaf litter, and even in your garden. Do you see the juvenile salamander indicated by the blue arrow next to the adult? These salamanders hatch from eggs and they look a lot like tiny versions of the adults. On the edge of the delta, found in oak woodlands, grasslands, and associated ponds, we have the California newt. Here you can see the entire life cycle of this newt from egg mass, which has the texture of a bouncy ball. Can you see those little developing newts in the egg mass? To young, which we call larval or aquatic newts. And you can see their little gills right there, pointed out with the blue arrow. And finally, the adult. And you can see that the adult is a really good swimmer, even, even in his full adult form. That third photo shows two newts fighting over an earthworm. We can also find the chorus frog, that little frog that everyone knows from its distinctive ribbit call, and the western toad. Both of these start out in eggs laid in the water, hatch into tadpoles, and then metamorph or change into the adult form that we see hopping, or in the case of the toad, waddling and crawling around. Look at the shape and texture of the frog and toad. Where, where chorus frogs are very small and relatively smooth, toads are larger, heavy-bodied, and warty. And look at that picture of that frog jumping. I like to think of chorus frogs as tiny ballerinas leaping in the air, and the toads as the little wrestlers. We have more species at the edge of the delta and beyond, which I won't discuss here, but I am next gonna discuss some of our special status species and why on earth does the Department of Water Resources care about herbs. 
what exactly is a special status species? Well, this is a term used to refer to species that have declining populations that put them at risk of eventual extinction. In the Delta, we have several species of special status species, um, both reptile and amphibian, including the Western pond turtle, the giant garter snake, the California red-legged frog, and the California tiger salamander. You may think the Department of Water Resources as, think of the Department of Water Resources as an agency that manages water throughout the state. And yes, that is a major role of the department, but it's not our only role. As Kathy said, part of our mission is to protect, restore, enhance natural and human environments. That means that it is important for us to ensure that we are protecting the reptiles and amphibians that we, as we manage our water resources. So at any time we conduct maintenance or improve structures, we evaluate what our actions might do to the reptiles and amphibians that share the state with us. This means figuring out what animals might be present at a given location and then coming up with ways to make sure we don't harm them, whether by adjusting what we do when we, what we, do, when we do work or changing how we do work and then being there as scientists to make sure that if any of these animals is in harm's way, that we can protect them from that harm. So let's learn a bit about the four main special status reptiles and amphibians that we work with in the Delta. This is the Western pond turtle, a California species of special concern, and it's our only native freshwater turtle in California. With our mild climate in the Delta, they can be visible for much of the year in sloughs, channels, and ponds, and are often spotted warming themselves in the sun, on logs, or the shore near water, or even on aquatic traps that have been set out for an entirely different purpose. If it floats or is above the water surface, they will try to sit on it. The life cycle clock shows what time of year the Western pond turtles do different things. They mate throughout spring, summer, and fall. The female will dig her nest on land near water, usually about 100 meters or 330 feet from water, to deposit her eggs in the spring or summer. While the baby turtles will hatch in fall, they'll actually often stay underground in the nest until the following spring when they dig out and they find a safe place to hide, feed, and grow. Springtime's a great time to see tiny turtles hiding in the water near shore. In the winter, western pond turtles often go dormant, which means they reduce their activity and find shelter to wait out the season until it warms again. This is especially true in colder parts of California. They can spend their winters in the water, even buried in the mud, or on land by burrowing into loose soil or leaf litter. They eat a lot of small insects, crustaceans or mollusks like shrimps and snails, algae and plants, small vertebrates, and they even nibble on dead animals. Because they need both aquatic and terrestrial habitat throughout their life cycle, they face threats such as habitat loss and habitat fragmentation, which is when they can no longer get from one place to another due to a roadway or a new building or something else that blocks their path. They also face competition with, from introduced turtle species like the red-eared slider. The giant garter snake is a state and federally listed th as threatened. It's only found in the Delta and the Central Valley of California. This snake requires water throughout the summer where it can hunt for its preferred food of small fish and amphibians. As you can see in the life cycle clock, the giant garter snake is active from about early spring when it starts to warm up until early to mid-October when it starts to cool down. They begin searching for mates as soon as they become active and continue to mate until May. Females give birth to live young between July and September. Giant garter snakes stay in or near the water for most of the summer, only moving into burrows during hot weather. When not in the water, they're often basking on shore or tucked into shoreline vegetation where they can quickly escape into the water. Once the weather turns cool and winter approaches, giant garter snakes begin to move to high ground and will enter burrows to spend the winter in a state of brumation. This is similar to hibernation, except the giant garter snakes do stay somewhat active, just underground. They need to be able to move around and seek out water to drink because even snakes can get dehydrated. Because much of the wetland habitat the giant garter snake uses, used to rely on, has been lost to development or land use changes, these snakes are now considered threatened with extinction. In the Sacramento Valley, rice has become a very important replacement source of summer water for giant garter snakes. The snakes use the agricultural ditches between fields for movement and looking for food. And young snakes will use the rice fields themselves once the rice gets taller as protection from animals that want to eat them, as well as for finding food. California red-legged frog is a California species of special concern, and it's federally listed as threatened. 
It is a large native frog that is found along the coast of California and inland, as well as in the Sierra Nevada mountains. They are found in ponds and small streams. This is very likely the frog that was made famous by Mark Twain's story, the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County. Although the frog jumping competitions nowadays are done with the introduced American bullfrog. In warmer areas, California red-legged frogs can be active to some degree year round. The timing for mating can, be, can vary based upon temperature and elevation, but generally they will mate from late to number, November until late April. During this time, you can hear the males call in the evening as they try to attract females. These frogs are active both during the day and at night, although they tend to be more active at night. Females will attach their egg masses to vegetation and the eggs will begin to hatch in one to four weeks. You can see what the egg mass looks like here. Tadpoles emerge from the eggs and will metamorphose slowly growing limbs and absorbing their tails and eventually resembling what you think of when we think of a frog. In some cases, tadpoles that hatch into ponds with water all year long can overwinter, meaning they'll stay tadpoles longer, not metamorphing, metamorphosing until the next spring and can grow bigger. Adults can most easily be identified by the two big ridges along their backs. These are called dorsolateral folds, dorsal meaning back and lateral meaning along the side. You can even see this, where these dorsolateral folds will be in the tadpole, where they appear, as, they appear as a line of gold flecks, which I've pointed out with a little blue arrow there. These frogs have suffered the same type of habitat loss and fragmentation that we have discussed already for the turtle and the garter snake. Additionally, introduced American bullfrog is a threat to California red-legged frog as both a competitor and a direct predator. The additional potential threat of disease such as chytrid fungus is still not fully understood for these frogs, but has caused large declines and extinctions for other frog species all over the world. The California tiger salamander is a state listed as threatened and federally it's listed as either threatened or endangered depending upon where they live. It's found primarily in seasonal pools nestled in the grasslands or on the edge of mixed woodland. They are found in a few distinct locations in the state, but due to habitat fragmentation and loss, some of these populations are very isolated. Adults spend most of their time, most of their lives underground in small mammal burrows, mainly ground squirrel or gopher burrows. As you can see in the life cycle clock, when the late fall, early winter rain comes and the adults leave their burrows and make their way to breeding ponds. Eggs are laid attached to vegetation as single eggs or small clusters. These eggs hatch within two to four weeks and the fully aquatic larvae will emerge. They can stay as larvae for up to three to six months where the, with the metamorphosis being triggered by the drying of the pond. The juveniles will leave the pond at nighttime and move onto land to seek burrows to spend the winter. Like other species we have discussed, California tiger salamanders have suffered from habitat loss and fragmentation, as well as getting eaten by introduced animals like fish or bullfrogs and loss of upland winter, winter habitat because people don't like rodents. When we remove animals that we consider pests, such as gophers and ground squirrels, their burrows will collapse and become unusable to all the other animals that rely on them. And that includes many animals in addition to the California tiger salamander, including birds like the burrowing owl. So as you can see, we have quite a variety of interesting reptiles and amphibians here in the Delta and throughout California. Much like bird watching, searching for reptiles and amphibians called field herping can be a wonderful activity, easily done while social distancing and even in your own backyard or local trails. Additionally, you can contribute to the overall knowledge of where animals are and learn new things about their behavior and habitat use. As the climate continues to change, understanding how reptiles and amphibians may adapt to is increasingly important. After all, if a pond that supports California tiger salamander does not hold water long enough, that year may produce no new salamanders, which could over time lead to the local loss of that population. So how can you get started field herping? Well, the first step is to be interested. Start noticing what's scurrying out of the way when you go for a walk in the park. There are many useful tools that you can help, help, help you to identify what you might encounter. Field guides are an invaluable tool and we are fortunate to have excellent guides written for the California herbs. There are also excellent websites with species information and online groups you can join and to learn from others that actively field herp. There are even books about field herping that are excellent resources for learning the techniques and proper etiquette of enjoying reptiles and amphibians in the wild. 
There are phone applications that can be used not only to help you identify a critter that you have found, but also to submit sightings and keep a running list of what cool animals you've seen. And you can and should always keep a notebook to record your observations. This will help you increase your skills and better understand where and when you can find a herb. There truly is a herb for every season, whether it's discovering a newt headed to a pond in December or a California king snake warming itself in the evening in, an er in the early summer, or picking up a piece of wood and discovering a slender salamander has made a home just below. There are many herbs out there waiting to be discovered and appreciated for the amazing, beautiful, and resourceful animals that they are. And of course, just one last thing to leave you with. When you do head out to explore the herb world, remember to tread lightly and identify before you get too close. Nobody needs to get bitten by a rattlesnake. And if you do lift something up to see what's under it, replace it as you found it, but move the herb out of the way first and let it crawl back on its own. Remember, no one really wants the roof of their house pulled up and no one wants to squish a new friend. Hope you have enjoyed this brief peek into the Delta herb world. Well, thank you, Veronica. Um, I'm wondering, did you always know that you wanted to study herbs or work with herbs? I didn't always know I wanted to work with herbs specifically. I did always know that I wanted to work with wildlife in some capacity. Mm -hmm. And so I started out thinking that the only option there was vet veterinary medicine. And then I realized that was really not for me. I didn't <laughs> want to be around sick, sick animals in an office all day and night. And I just wanted to be outside and find a way to engage with wildlife in the wild. And so herpetology, while it wasn't my first focus, definitely became my love. Okay. So you didn't go to school then to, to focus on herps? No. Interestingly enough, I went to school in my undergrad at San Francisco State. I focused on desert adapted rodents. Oh. And then when I continued on to graduate school, I focused on uh, green sturgeon. So... <laughs> Both of those are quite far from the herb world, um, but I did, I did keep pep, pet uh, turtles and snakes uh, as a child, and even when I was uh, studying the desert adapted rodents and the fish, I was always noticing and um, watching the herbs that were around me when I was in the field, and so it was always kind of on the periphery, and then my first job out of college um, was with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service down at the San Luis National Wildlife Refuge, and um, my first job was working with giant garter snakes and I really um, was bit by them, so to speak. And <laughs> I never wanted to stop working with herps. And while I've done a lot of other species throughout my career, even after that, um, I always seem to come back to the herps. Cool. Were there, so you mentioned earlier that um, herps rely on rodent holes for, for places to live. Were, were you finding herps in the, the rodent holes when you were doing your, your undergrad research? Um, when I did my undergrad research, there were definitely herps in the vicinity of the holes. Um, I was working on uh, gerbils in Uzbekistan, so oh. so I wasn't as familiar with the the herps of that region. Um, okay. But there were definitely a lot of other animals that were sharing those burrows, very similar to what we have here in California, with uh, a lot of animals relying on on burrows that were dug by a single animal, but then shared as a communal space in a lot of ways. Okay, great. So um, in some of your pictures, I noticed that you were handling some of the herps. Um, if there's people who are watching who maybe want to catch a lizard or a snake um, or have kids that might want to do that, what should, what should they know about handling herps? Is it, is it a good idea? Is it okay? What should, what should you look out for? There's a couple of things that you should do. Before you go to grab a herp, you definitely want to know what it is. What are you grabbing? And then you want to think about how can how can I potentially handle this animal without causing it any harm or causing any harm to myself. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of an amphibian, uh, you would want to make sure you had nice, clean, moist hands. And the other thing that you really want to think about is what are the rules in my state? So, for instance, if you were to be lucky enough to come across a California red-legged frog, and it was right where you could easily grab it, you really sh still should not handle that animal. That animal uh, needs to be handled by only a permitted biologist. And, and that's because these animals that are listed um, are in danger of extinction. And we wanna make sure that we don't uh, cause any potential loss of any of these animals or introduction of any kind of pathogens that could harm them. 
So you wanna be familiar with the rules. And in California, um, a lot of these common animals can be easily handled with uh, something as simple as a fishing license. A fishing license will allow you to handle things like your common snakes and your, your common salamanders. Um, but you wanna make sure that you're uh, doing it properly. You wanna make sure that you uh, first go with somebody else who's done it before and learn some techniques on how to handle something really gently. When you catch something, you don't wanna grab it or squish it. You wouldn't wanna accidentally grab a lizard and have him drop his tail because while he can grow it back, that's a lot of energy that he has to put into growing back that tail that could have been used for other things like reproduction. And you also, you don't wanna cause any physical harm to the animal by holding it too tight or, or anything like that. So there's a lot of things to, that go into handling a, an animal carefully. And um, it's best to start by going with somebody experienced and and doing some reading on it and really being prepared before you go out and try to grab anything. And certainly don't, don't try to grab anything venomous. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good idea. Um, somebody wants to know, is it possible to put a little pond in their backyard to attract some herps? They, they'd like to maybe see and hear some of the frogs you were talking about. I think it's a wonderful idea to, to if you have adequate water in your area to go ahead and create a water feature. I would discourage anyone from finding a herp and moving it to their pond because these animals will often try to go home and it often results in, in their death because they don't know how to get home. They're dealing with a bunch of new way, barriers to their making it home and they could potentially be eaten or crushed or what have you and it's, it's really not healthy. Plus they could bring back unknown pathogens from your pond. So don't go out and collect things and add them to your pond. But if you want to dig a pond and see what shows up, I think that's a wonderful idea. Sort of a, if you build it, they will come scenario. Yeah, and, and they may not come. And it's like anything with wildlife, you don't know, but you certainly will attract something. You'll probably, if nothing else, get birds coming and drinking from it. Cool. Um, do herps live in more extreme environments, like really high elevations where there's ice on the ponds, or you already mentioned that, that some of them live in the desert, right? Yeah, and actually they do. And there's, uh, interestingly enough, there are California red-legged frogs that live in the Sierra Nevadas. And uh, they live in areas where it does snow. And so they will not start to emerge for reproduction until it's warmed up a little. So they come out a little bit later in the season than, than our uh, lower elevation frogs. Um, there's mountain yellow-legged frogs that are at higher elevation as well. You know, and even rattlesnakes can go quite high in elevation. Um, I believe... Uh, it, it's quite high, it's higher than you would anticipate, like well mm -hmm. over 8,000 feet in elevation. Um, so it's interesting what can survive at high elevation. Um, there are salamanders that live uh, just in high elevation areas, like the Mount Lyle salamander, I believe, is found in a very, very localized area in the Sierras. So um, they do live in quite, quite harsh environments sometimes. Cool. Um, what is your favorite herb? It's really, really hard to choose, um, mm -hmm. but I, if I had to narrow it down to one or two animals, uh, the horned lizards really way up there. Horned lizards are, are super cool little animals. Uh, they're often found in drier environments. They're flat to the ground and they have these wonderful little kind of crown of horns on their heads. And um, they're just really neat little guys. Uh, we have one that's found in, in the Bay Area and the edge of the Delta, um, which is called the Coast Horned Lizard. And mm -hmm. um, we also have the Desert Horned Lizard in Southern California, and both of those are just wonderful little animals. Cool. You, you mentioned the, um, the blue belly lizards, which are, are one of the more common lizards people can see that you mm -hmm. can see them doing push-ups. Do we know why they do push-ups? It's, it's, uh, it's done to display to other males. Um, and to show them that they're they're pretty tough. I've seen their muscles. It's, it's it's definitely I'm a tough little lizard here. <laughs> Look at all the push-ups I can do. Um, so it is a display for them. Um, I think they use it in other ways too. Uh, but they are they are wonderful to observe because they do tend to be out and about. And you will I, on a hike yesterday. I think I saw ten of them. Oh wow! Uh, yeah. So they're they're one of those things that's quite easy to observe and there tend to be a lot of them and um, you can observe them doing some really fantastic behaviors in addition to the push-ups I've, I've seen two males you know squaring off for battle and you know the little mouths open and you know it's fantastic awesome 
Well, is what would be some things, so you mentioned, you know, some of the herbs are very common and some are species of special concern. What are a couple of things that people can do to help help herbs out? Oh, well, the, the, one, the first thing you can do is just really, you know, learn about them as much as you can and talk to other people about them. Uh, uh, people have a, there's, there's a certain amount of natural fear for humans to things that seem injurious. And so snakes are very scary to a lot of people and lizards can be very scary to a lot of people. And just talking about how, uh, how they work into the ecosystem and why they're important. You know, they're not only um, something that keeps down pests, but they're also something that, that um, adds to the food chain there. They, they improve the soils. They're, they're, they're a very important part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so learn about them, share your enthusiasm and your knowledge about them. And, um, you know, do your best not to harm them. Uh, you know, I, it's not always possible not to run over something that's crossing their road, but, uh, but look around and, and try not to as much as you can uh, without putting yourself in danger and um, get involved, get involved with uh, societies and groups that are, uh, that they're trying to do good things for these animals. Uh, there are plenty of them that you can find on, on the internet um, that are focused on anything from all reptiles and amphibians to a specific reptile or an, a specific amphibian and just get to know them and, and then spread the word that they're very cool animals. Right. Well, thank you, Veronica, for um, joining us today and helping spread the word about these really cool animals, these herps, am amphibians, and reptiles. Um, if anybody watching would like to learn more about herps, uh, Veronica's provided us with a couple of resources, a couple of websites and apps, uh, CaliforniaHerps.com and iNaturalist and Seek, which are really fun apps, as well as a field guide, um, that she two field guides um, that she feels would be really, really great if you want to get started learning about herps. Um, and of course, if you want to learn more about the Delta in general, you can always visit our website. Uh, water.ca.gov. Um, we have specific pages on the Delta, and we also have free educational materials, um, coloring sheets and fact sheets about the Delta, uh, some workbooks that you're welcome to order and um, use with your kids at home if they'd like to learn more about the Delta. I'd like to thank everybody at home again for joining us today. We will be back next Wednesday for the, our last of the Delta series, our Denizens of the Delta, part of Water Wednesdays. Um, and we'll be here at one o'clock p.m. next Wednesday with Gina Darren, who will be talking about Delta invaders. We hope to see you then. In the meantime, have a great week, everyone. Take care and um, see you next week. Bye-bye.